Hello, welcome to Chapter 12, Part 2, The Ideal Gas Law and the PV Diagram. We're going to start by talking about something called state variables. How can we describe the state of an ideal gas? Well, we can describe the gas by using so-called state variables, such as the temperature of the gas. This is something we've already talked about um, earlier in this chapter and also previous chapters. The volume of the gas, how much uh, space the gas occupies. We can talk about the pressure of the gas, which is something we're going to uh, describe shortly. And we can talk about the number or the amount of gas, either in the number of moles of gas or the total number of molecules. So this is a list here of state variables for an ideal gas that tells us pretty much everything we need to know about the gas. So our goal in the section is to come up with a law that describes the relationship between these state variables. And this is called the ideal gas law. Let's start with uh, probably the simplest one um, state variable, and that is the volume. The volume of a gas is just the amount of space the gas occupies. So if the gas were in a box like this, we would just find the volume of the box, which is found by its length times its width times its height, and we would just multiply those numbers together. For example, 3 meters times 2 meters times 2 meters would give us a total volume of 12 cubic meters. Um, by the way, the cubic meters, that is the unit that we will use to measure volume. So the ideal gas law is going to be um, used in cubic meters. Um, so what makes the, the only thing that's really tricky about volume is that oftentimes volume will be given to us in other units and we'll have to convert to cubic meters. So for example, volumes, uh, volume is sometimes given in liters sometimes in milliliters, which is designated as ML, or even sometimes in cubic centimeters, or cc's. So um, in either of these cases here, we're going to most um, often convert this to cubic meters. So this is, these are the conversions here. Um, it turns out that there are 1,000 liters uh, per cubic meter. So uh, one liter of gas is 0.001, cubic meter or one thousandth of a cubic meter. Um, likewise, um, one meter cubed is one million square centimeters, all right, because a meter cubed is 100 by 100 by 100 centimeters and 100 times 100 times 100 is 10 to the sixth or one million. So a cubic centimeter is 10 to the minus six meters. Um, furthermore, a milliliter is the same as a cubic centimeter, or a cc, which is, again, 10 to the minus 6 meters cubed. So um, this is something that you know we'll have to uh, occasionally refer to when we um, convert the volume of a gas to cubic meters. The next state variable we're going to introduce here is called pressure. And um, here's a good activity that you can do right now at your um, desk at home um, to uh, um, experience what we mean by pressure. So take a pencil or a pen and hold it between your two index fingers like this and gently squeeze, all right? We don't want to squeeze hard enough that uh, we puncture your finger here. But um, if you're holding the pencil still, which finger is pushing harder? The left one or the right one? Well, Newton's second law, which is net force equals ma, tells us that both fingers must be pushing with the same amount of force, right? Because the pencil's not moving, it's not accelerating, so there's no net force. However, the pencil, obviously, you can feel it more in this finger, where it has the point, than it is in this one. And why is that? That's because the pressure is greater on your finger in this case where the point of the pencil is compared to the pressure on your finger here. So the pressure is greater when a force is concentrated into a small area. So the definition of pressure is force divided by the area of the surface that the force is acting on. So pressure is equal to force divided by area. And the units of pressure are force, which is in newtons, divided by area, which is square meters. So a newton per square meter is called a pascal, and it's abbreviated PA, just like 
Pennsylvania. Uh, this is named after the uh, French physicist Pascal. So let's do just a quick example here to calculate pressure. What pressure does a 200 kilogram refrigerator exert on the floor? Assume the bottom of the refrigerator is one by one meters in it's a square uh, footprint for the refrigerator. So the pressure is equal to the force, which is the weight of the refrigerator divided by the area. The weight of the refrigerator is just mg. So we have 200 kilograms times 9.8. And the area of the refrigerator pushing on the floor is one square meter because it's one times one. So um, this turns out to be 1,960 pascals. So we're going to be talking about gases um, in this um, lecture, not pressure due to a refrigerator. So um, what causes the pressure in gases? Well, the pressure is caused by the gas molecules colliding with the container walls. So you can envision, you know, remember our model of an ideal gas. We have lots and lots of gas atoms uh, bouncing around inside this container. Well, every time one of these little atoms strikes the wall of the container, it pushes on it a little bit. And remember, there are trillions and trillions of these atoms inside the container. In fact, every second, there are trillions and trillions of atoms colliding with the wall. So what this does is it creates an outward push against the wall, and this is what it causes pressure in a gas. Likewise, when we blow up a balloon like this and force air inside of it, the pressure of the gas inside the balloon pushes against the walls of the balloon, causing it to expand. Um, pressure is um, measured in different units. We talked about the Pascal. Um, for gases, we often use um, atmospheric pressure. And so one atmospheric pressure, or one ATM for atmosphere, is the pressure that you're experiencing right now. It's the pressure when you're near sea level. I'm assuming that you're not up on a mountaintop um, at the moment. So near sea level, um, the pressure, atmospheric pressure on Earth is called one atmosphere, and that's the equivalent of 101,300 pascals. Another uh, unit that's sometimes used, we won't be using it uh, in this course, but it's the pounds uh, per square inch, or PSI. Um, this is what your tire gauge on your car, um, if you check your, your tire pressure in your car, it's measuring in uh, PSI. Um, same thing with a, a hand pump. If you pump up a bike tire, your um, pump might have a pressure gauge on it, and that's measuring uh, PSI. So atmospheric pressure is about 15, it's 14.7 pounds per square inch. Now that's a lot. That means that every square inch of your body is being pushed on with 15 pounds of atmospheric pressure. Now normally that would crush your body um, if you add up you know, all the square inches across your body. The reason your body doesn't get crushed is because the pressure inside your body is equalized to the pressure outside. So there is no net force um, you know, crushing your body. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about this um, more uh, when we deal with fluids in a uh, future chapter. So our goal now is to take these um, various state variables, temperature, pressure, volume, and the amount of gas, the number of moles, um, and come up with a relationship that puts them all together. And so this is going to be called the ideal gas law. So there were a number of experiments that were done over 100 years ago to find this relationship. Um, for example, one of them found that the pressure of a gas is proportional to the temperature of the gas. And this makes sense. If we have a cold gas, the gas atoms inside the container are moving slowly. Remember, that's what temperature means, is how much kinetic energy those gas atoms have. So if we heat up the gas, right, if we put it over a flame and raise the temperature of the gas, what does that mean? Well, that just means the gas atoms are now moving around faster inside this container. And if they move around faster, they have more energy and they slam into the walls of the container with higher speed and force. Therefore, the pressure inside the gas increases. So um, it turns out that the pressure, you know, if you double basically the absolute temperature of the gas, 
you double the temperature. So temper, uh, pressure is proportional to temperature. That's what this symbol means, proportional to. Um, another one that's, um, you know, again, pretty easy to um, visualize is that the pressure of a gas is inversely proportional to the volume of the gas. So that just means if we take some gas that's at some pressure here and we squeeze down the size of the container, all right, you can imagine shrinking the container. Well, now we've got, you know, the same amount of gas, but it's in a smaller volume. So these gas molecules have less distance to travel before they run into a wall and push on it. So therefore, if we make the volume half as much, we get twice as much pressure. Okay, so that's why there is an inverse uh, proportion. There, it's proportional to one over the volume. And the third one, uh, the third characteristic here is also pretty easy to visualize. The pressure of a gas is proportional to how much gas is in the tank. And this is um, indicated by N. Remember, that means the number of moles of gas. So if we start out here, let's say, with one mole of gas inside this container here, then let's say we pump in another mole of gas. So there's now two moles of gas in here. Well, now we've got twice as many atoms bouncing around inside here, and that's going to create more pressure, and so the pressure will double. So we can put all this together. Pressure is proportional to temperature, so here's temperature on top. It's proportional to the number of moles, and put that on top. And remember, it's inversely proportional to the volume, so we'll put that on the bottom. So the pressure is proportional to nT over V. And so instead of writing this as a fraction, let's move this V over to the left side by multiplying both sides by V. So we get pressure times volume is proportional to the number of moles times the absolute temperature of the gas. So this is a proportionality. The way we make this an equation is by just inserting a constant in there that makes this side equal to this side. And this constant, um, we're, right now, we're going to call this R. This is the universal gas constant. So we'll turn this into an equation, and here it is. This is the ideal gas law. Pressure times volume is equal to RNT. So the ideal gas law is um, usually called Pivnert. And the reason it's called this is because if you tried to say this, you would come up with something that sounds like Pivnert. PV equals NRT. So again, P is the pressure of the gas in pascals. V is the volume of the gas in cubic meters. N is the number of moles of gas. R is the universal gas constant. And here is the number that we're going to be using. R is equal to 8.314 joules per Kelvin per mole of gas, all right? And so as long as we're using the correct units, we can just put in this number 8.314 into this equation. And then T, of course, is the temperature, but remember, this is the absolute temperature of the gas in Kelvins, okay? So this is, this is Pivnert. Now, what is the ideal gas law? Well, it's a law that describes the relationship between the state variables of an ideal gas, namely pressure, volume, number of moles, and temperature. And uh, the ideal gas law is a, one of the most fundamental laws in physics. Let's look at an example where we can use the ideal gas law. A scuba tank has a volume of 10 liters and is pressurized to 200 atmospheres at room temperature, which is 22 degrees Celsius. How many moles of air are in the tank? Okay, so let's use Pivnert, and we're going to solve this for the number of moles, n, okay? But before we do that, we have to do a little work because the pressure here was given to us in atmospheres, not in pascals. So let's first um, uh, go ahead and convert uh, 200 atmospheres to pascals. So remember, there are 101,300 pascals per atmosphere. Okay, that's the conversion. So we just take 200 and multiply it by this big number here, and we get 2.03 times 10 to the 7th pascals. All right, that's 20 million pascals. 
The next thing we have to do is, you know, the volume here was given to us as 10 liters. We need to convert that to cubic meters. So um, if we look back, you know, a few slides ago, remember that one, there are 1,000 liters per cubic meter. Or another way of saying that, there are there is 1,000th of a cubic meter per liter. So 0 0.001 cubic meters per liter. So you can see the liters here cancel out. So 10 times this number is 0 0.01 cubic meters. And finally, the temperature, remember that in Pivnert, the temperature has to be in Kelvins. So we have to convert 22 degrees Celsius to Kelvins. Well, that's easy. Remember, all you do is add 273. So our Kelvin temperature is 295 Kelvins. So now we can go ahead and use Pivnert here and let's solve for N, the number of moles. So all we have to do is divide by RT. So N is equal to PV over RT, and we can plug in all these numbers up here. Here's our pressure, here's our volume. Remember the ideal gas constant is 8.314, so I just used 8.31, that's usually sufficient. And our Kelvin temperature there, 295. So all of this comes out to be 83, and remember this is, uh, we're talking about N is the number of moles. So there are 83 moles of gas inside this tank. There is an alternate form of the ideal gas law that is sometimes useful. Um, I will skip over the um, derivation of this form. It's actually quite simple. It's basically um, a definition of Boltzmann's constant. But um, what happens when we do this alternate form is, you know, we still have a, the ideal gas law, but it's written a little different. Instead of uh, written as Pivnert or PV equals NRT, it's now PV equals big N times Boltzmann's constant times temperature. So what is um, uppercase N? Well, uppercase N is not the number of moles. It's the number of molecules. And instead of R for a constant, which is the universal gas constant, we use Boltzmann's constant here. Remember, Boltzmann's constant, we saw it before. It has a value of 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23rd. So this, um, uh, this is um, a different form of the ideal gas law. So the question now, of course, is which one do I use? Well, it depends on the situation. We've got, you know, PV equals NRT, Pivnert. Use this form when dealing with little n, lowercase n, which is the number of moles. And R here, remember, is the universal gas constant, 8.314. We'll use this form here, PV equals uppercase n, kt when we're dealing with big n which is the number of molecules and here the uh, constant is boltzmann's constant which is 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23rd so here's an example where we can use the alternate form of the ideal gas law um, UHV or ultra high vacuum systems are used in laboratories and electronics factories to achieve pressures as low as one trillionth of atmospheric pressure. This is about 100 nanopascals. Suppose a UHV chamber has a volume of one liter. How many gas molecules are inside the chamber at room temperature? So we're going to use PV equals big N KT because we're, going to, we're dealing with um, uppercase N. We're trying to figure out how many gas molecules, not how many moles. So um, the pressure we were told is 100 um, nanopascals. So nano is 1 billionth or 10 to the minus 9. So the pressure is 100 times 10 to the minus 9 pascals. Uh, that's the same as 1 times 10 to the minus 7 pascals. Just moving the decimal over to uh, the volume we were told was 1 liter. So let's convert that to cubic meters. So remember um, we multiply by 0 0.001 cubic meters per liter to get our volume of 0 0.001 cubic meter. The temperature, um, we're using room temperature here, 22 Celsius. So again, we're going to convert that to Kelvins by adding 273, and we get 295 Kelvins. So finally, we're going to sell, we're going to take the ideal gas law here, and we're going to solve for N, big N, the number of molecules. So big N is equal to PV over KT. So plugging in our numbers, here's the pressure from up here. Uh, here's the volume from right here. This is Boltzmann's constant, K. 
and here's our temperature right here. And so when you do the math here, surprisingly, this comes out to be 2.5 times 10 to the 10, which is still a big number. So this is 25 billion molecules. So even the best vacuums that we can make in a lab, uh, remember this, this vacuum here is one trillion times less um, pressure than the atmosphere. So, you know, that is a, a extremely good vacuum chamber, but there's still 25 billion molecules in it. So even the best vacuums contain lots of molecules. There's a um, state of a gas that um, is used often in uh, physics and chemistry, and it's called standard temperature and pressure, or STP. So um, what is STP? Well, it's defined as follows. The temperature is, you know, this is kind of arbitrary. It's defined as the freezing point of water, which is 32 Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius, which is 273 Kelvin. So that's the standard temperature. The standard um, pressure is just um, atmospheric pressure, one atmosphere, uh, which is 101,300 Pascals. So if we think of the ideal gas law, we've got PV equals nRT, pivnert. Let's take, um, let's take one mole of an ideal gas at standard temperature and pressure and figure out what the volume of this gas would be. So we're just going to take pivnert here and solve for V. So V is equal to nRT over P. And remember, we're going to use one mole of gas. So um, N is one, one mole. R is, here's our gas constant, 8.31. Standard temperature, 273 Kelvins. Standard pressure, 101,300 Pascals. So if you multiply this together, you come out with a volume of 0 0.0224 cubic meters. Let's convert that to liters. Remember, there are 1,000 liters per cubic meter. So we just multiply this number by 1,000, which you can do in your head. You just move the decimal three places over, and look what we get, 22.4 liters. So this is a um, yet another property um, of a mole. So uh, a mole can be defined as follows. It occupies a volume of 22.4 liters at STP. A mole also contains Avogadro's number of molecules, remember that, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules, and a mole, we learned, has a mass equal to its molecular weight in grams. So these are three sort of definitions, if you will, um, of what we mean by a mole of gas. And this new one is that a mole of gas at STP um, occupies a volume of 22.4 liters. The next thing we're going to do here is introduce a really um, helpful tool to work with um, ideal gases. And this tool is a uh, graph actually called a PV diagram. So um, what we're going to deal with here are so-called ideal gas processes. And we're going to use a PV diagram to track these processes and to analyze them. So first of all, what do we mean by an ideal gas process? Well, an ideal gas process is a way of taking the system, you know, which contains this gas, from some state A to another state B. Now remember what we mean by a state, it's a description of the system in terms of state variables, such as temperature, pressure, in volume. So um, this is uh, so it's useful to plot the process on a pressure versus volume graph or PV for pressure volume PV diagram. So in this example here, what this shows, notice in the graph we we plot volume down here on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, and we plot pressure on the vertical axis. This is a state where the gas starts. We'll call it state A. So this is our starting place. So on this graph, we could, um, we could read off the pressure of the gas, so we'll call that P sub A. We could read off the volume of the gas, and that would be V sub A. And this gas here is going to be associated with some temperature, which we don't get um, directly from the graph here. All right, let's say we take this gas and we change its state. In other words, 
we change the volume of the gas. We increase its volume. That lowered the, the gas's pressure and its temperature probably changed too. So this is the new state of the gas, or maybe the final state, if this is the initial state. The gas is now over here on the PV diagram. It has a different pressure, it has a different volume, and um, it will learn how to figure out that it also has a different temperature as well. And this arrow here um, represents the path that the system took on this PV diagram. All right, and so this is what we're going to be um, working with um, in the remaining um, uh, part of this lecture. So to make this as um, simple and basic as possible for us, we're going to only be dealing with ideal gas processes in sealed containers. Now what that means, a sealed container is a closed system. So that means no gas can get in or no gas can escape. So the number of moles, N, will be a constant. N will not be changing here. Um, so let's let's take a look at again this this hypothetical case here where we start at some point A here. This is our our initial state of the gas. So we can write um, uh, the ideal gas law, Pivnert, um, for state A. So this is PV equals nRT. But notice we have to keep track of pressure. This is at state A, so we call it P sub A. The volume is V sub A. Um, the temperature over here is the temperature at state A, so we'll call it T sub A. Now, N is the number of moles. That's not going to change, so we don't have to put an A on it. Likewise, R is the gas constant. Well, a constant is a constant, right? It doesn't change, so we won't put an A there either. Um, one thing we can do here is a little trick. Let's put all the things that change, all the variables, over on the left side. So notice this T over here. Let's move it over to the left side. We're going to divide by T. So we've got all our variables. Our state, our state uh, variables are over here, pressure, volume, and temperature. And on the right side are the things that don't vary. These are the constants, the number of moles N and the gas constant R. We can do the same thing for state B, or which is our final state of the gas here. We write Pivnert and put Bs in you know, the subscripts instead of As, and let's solve for PV over T for state B, and on the right side again are the constants. Now here's a, a nifty little trick. This on the right over here is N times R. Well, so is this over here time is N times R. So in other words, the left sides of these equations must be equal to each other because the right sides of the equations are equal to each other. So we can write PA times VA divided by TA is equal to PB times VB over TB. This is the equation for an ideal gas in a sealed container going from any state A to another state B. It will, um, it, we have a relationship now between the state variables in these various states, state A on the left and state B on the right. So we're going to be able to use this now to analyze um, a system that contains gas that goes from some uh, point A to some point B. Let's, we'll see some examples now. So our first uh, example is one where we're going to hold the volume constant. And so constant volume, the, uh, the Latin way to say this is isochoric. All right, iso means constant, keeping something um, static or unchanging. And choric has to do with volume. So an isochoric um, process is a process where the gas does not change volume. Now, what would be an example of that? Well, suppose we have a um, container here full of gas, and the container has rigid, thick metal walls. So if, if we heat up this gas, the gas inside the container is still at the same volume. The container has not changed size. It's not allowed to expand or contract here. So the volume is staying the same. So um, if we look at this process on a PV diagram, um, it, it's represented by a vertical line on the PV diagram. Now, why is that? Well, because remember what we're plotting down here is volume, and the volume is not changing. It's constant. So the, the gas can only move and change in pressure 
and therefore temperature as well. So it can go up and down along a vertical line, but it can't move horizontally, okay? So if we take our result from the last slide, remember we had PV over T for the final, you know, state B, let's say, is equal to PV over T for state A, or let's call it initial here. Um, we know that the final volume here, V final, is equal to the initial volume. So we can cancel out the Vs. They're the same on both sides. So all we're left with now for an isochoric process is a much simpler result. We have P final over T final is equal to P initial over T initial. So this is, you know, the ideal gas law now has has come down to something that's um, greatly simplified uh, because of the um, condition of an isochoric process. So let's go through uh, an example uh, using an isochoric process. So here's our scuba tank again. We've got a scuba tank pressurized to 200 atmospheres at room temperature, 22 degrees Celsius. What is the tank pressure on an Arctic expedition when the temperature drops to zero degrees Celsius. All right, so here's the diver, you know, diving under the ice and the ocean water is um, at the freezing point of water, uh, zero degrees Celsius, okay? Um, we wanna find out um, what happened to the pressure in this scuba tank. So this is an isochoric process. Now, how do we know that? Well, we know it because this tank here is a rigid, you know, stiff container that's not gonna change its shape or volume. So we can use P final over T final equals P initial over T initial. The initial temperature was 22 Celsius. Remember, we have to convert that to Kelvins. So we add 273 to get 295 Kelvins. The final temperature was zero degrees Celsius. Let's convert that to Kelvins. We just add 273, which is 273 Kelvins. So what we're gonna do here is we wanna find out what's the final pressure. So we're gonna solve for P final here. So that's easy. We just multiply both sides by T final, the temp final temperature. So we get final pressure is equal to initial pressure times final temperature divided by initial temperature. So now we can plug in our, our values. Uh, now what I'm doing here is um, I'm going to figure out the pressure in atmospheres, all right? Um, we were not told we have to convert to Pascals. So in this case, I can, I can leave the pressure in atmospheres. So I'm gonna use 200 atmospheres for my initial pressure. Uh, 273 for my final temperature and 295 for my initial temperature. And this comes out to 185. And remember, we're working in atmospheres here. If we converted this to Pascals, that would be okay. We would come out with an answer in Pascals. But in this case, we don't have to. We can keep it in atmospheres. Now, let's think about what happened. The pressure dropped from 200 atmospheres up here when it was warm at room temperature, and it dropped down to 185 atmospheres. Why is that? Well, it dropped just because the gas got colder. Remember that the pressure um, goes up as the temperature increases. Likewise, the pressure drops when the temperature drops. The next kind of process we're going to look at here is a constant pressure process. And this is called isobaric. Um, the word uh, bar uh, comes from uh, the Latin for pressure, like a, a barometer or barometric pressure. You may have heard, heard that term talking about the air pressure. Um, so isobaric means constant pressure. Now, how could we um, how could we do this in an actual process? Well, one thing we could do is we could put the gas in a cylinder like this, and the cylinder is capped off here with a movable piston that can slide up and down. And this is something that's um, found very uh, common in, uh, for example, hydraulic systems have a moving um, piston inside of a cylinder, and inside the engine of your car, if your car, for example, is a four-cylinder engine or a six-cylinder engine, it has cylinders like this with a movable piston here. So in this case, all we're doing here is on top of the piston, we're placing a mass, and that mass, of course, has weight, which pushes down on the piston and therefore pushes down on the gas. But this pressure 
um, that it's pushing with is constant because the mass stays the same. So if we take this gas, for example, and start it you know, at room temperature with this mass on it, all right, and then we heat up the gas by putting it over a flame, well, remember what happens here is uh, the gas temperature is going to increase, and that's going to increase the pressure of the gas, which is going to push up on this piston. But since the piston is able to move upward, it will keep a constant pressure um, inside this container. All right, so the pressure is um, is determined um, or governed by how much mass is on top of the piston. So in this case, we have a horizontal line on the PV diagram. Remember the pressure is on this vertical axis. So whatever the pressure is here, it's just designated as P, that pressure stays the same from the initial case over here to the final state, which is over here. So notice what's changing is the volume is changing, right? The volume is increasing and the temperature is also going to increase as well. Um, we'll figure out how to deal with temperature um, shortly. But for now, we just know that an isobaric process um, is designated as a horizontal line on the PV diagram. So going back a few slides where we have PV over T for the final state, is equal to PV over T for the initial state, uh, we can now cancel out the pressure on both sides of the equation because they're equal. So um, for isobaric uh, processes, we have V final over T final equals V initial over T initial. So let's go ahead and work through an example um, using an isobaric process. So we have a mass of 10 kilograms is placed on top of a piston that has an area of 0.01 square meters. So here's the picture here. The cylinder initially uh, contains two liters of gas. Uh, the cylinder is placed over a fire so that the gas temperature increases from 20 degrees Celsius to 200 degrees Celsius. All right. So, um, the, what happens here is we're told the initial volume here of the gas is two liters. Um, and after we um, heat up the gas, all right, we're told its temperature increases from 20 to 200 Celsius. And so we see the volume is you know, increased, but remember the pressure is gonna be the same because of this mass up there, which does not change. So the first question is, what is the final volume? Um, so let's go ahead and, you know, as always, we're gonna uh, usually have to uh, convert the temperatures here. So the initial temperature of 20 degrees Celsius converts to 293 kelvins. The final temperature of 200 Celsius, we just add 273 to get 473 kelvins. For an isobaric process, we have V final over T final equals V initial over T initial. We're going to solve for the final volume V sub F, which is shown right here. So V sub F is V sub I times TF over TI. The initial volume, let's just do it in liters first of all. All right, so we can leave this in terms of two liters and the two temperatures are 473 over 293. Um, so this gives us a volume of 3.2 liters. Um, they finally, they want us to, um, we're, we're being asked here to plot this process on a PV diagram. Well, we know it's going to be um, a horizontal line, but we want to actually know what are the numbers are. What is the pressure and what are the uh, volumes? So let's figure out what the pressure is. So the pressure, to figure this out, um, a little trick here. We know that the uh, the weight up here is uh, has uh, a force due to its weight. And pressure due to this weight is force divided by area. But we also have outside here, we have atmospheric pressure, all right? We're gonna assume that we're doing this experiment, um, you know, somewhere near sea level. So the total pressure is the atmospheric pressure of one atmosphere plus the pressure due to the mass, which is the force divided by area. And the force is the weight, mg, divided by the area. So one atmosphere of pressure, remember, is 101,000 pascals. Um, I rounded it. It's actually 101,300, but that's the fourth, you know, um, place there in the number. So it's it's you can safely round this to 101,000 pascals. And then here we have mg divided by the area. We were told that the 
area of the piston is 0.01 square meters. So adding this number to this number gives us a, a pressure of 110,800 pascals. So that's the number here that has been plotted. Um, we know that the gas starts at 2 liters, so that's shown down here, and it ends up, remember, at 3.2 liters. So what we're actually plotting here is volume in liters, okay, instead of cubic meters. Um, and this is sometimes the case where um, we can work with different units of volume. There's a third type of process here that's important, and this one is not constant volume or constant pressure. This one is constant temperature. And so this is called an isothermal process. So isothermal literally means constant temperature. And an isothermal process is a process that moves along a path which is called an isotherm. So in this plot here, this is a PV diagram, these red lines here are called isotherms. And what an isotherm is, is it's a constant temperature path. So let's take this one. Notice it's labeled T1. So whatever T1 is here, let's say it's um, 100 kelvins. This path here follows uh, the same temperature. Everything along this path is 100 kelvins. Notice that the pressure and the volume are changing, but the temperature is not. Here's another isotherm for T2. This would be, let's say, 150 kelvins. This is a warmer temperature. It has a sort of similar shaped path here, but it's displaced from T1's path. Here's T3's path going along this isotherm, T4's path, and so on and so forth. So you can see that um, increasing temperature moves in this direction. It kind of moves up and to the right. All right, so T1 is low temperature. T4 on this, in this diagram is the highest temperature. So um, in this, uh, uh, so the one question is, how do we actually use or do an isothermal process? How do we keep the gas at the same temperature? Well, one way to do this is by submersing our piston of gas into a bath, a large reservoir at some constant temperature. So for example, this could be an ice bath. And if it's an ice bath, that would be, you know, the ice water would be at basically the freezing temperature of water, which would be zero degrees Celsius or 273 Kelvin. So that ice bath, this reservoir here of cold water, would keep this gas here at a constant temperature because the gas is going to be in thermal equilibrium with its surroundings here as long as this bath is large enough. So this is a, a common method um, to um, produce a, an isothermal process. All right, so um, the reason these curves look like you know, these curves here and not a straight line is these are actually hyperbolas. If we take Pivner to PV equals NRT, and um, remember we're saying the temperature now is constant. So look at the right side, N. Remember, that's a constant. We're not adding or taking away gas. That's the number of moles. R is, of course, the gas constant. That doesn't change. And now we're saying that for an isothermal process, T is a constant as well. So everything on the right side is a constant. That means that P times V, pressure times volume, has to be constant. So pressure is equal to whatever that constant is divided by the volume. And this is the mathematical equation for a hyperbola, which is this um, curved path along here. You may remember hyperbolas from your um, math class, from your algebra class. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and look at this process here. We're going to push down on this piston and we're going to compress this gas. This is called an isothermal compression. So notice what's happening here. Um, the gas starts here at um, some state A, which is when the piston is up here. That's the initial point. And by compressing the gas, we're going to move, and remember it's in this ice bath here, so it's isothermal. The gas is going to move along this isotherm up to its new state B, 
which is when the piston is down here. So notice the volume has gone from volume A, which was large, to volume B, which is small. So we're moving to the left on our PV diagram because the volume is getting smaller. Well, if we're crunching all this gas and squeezing it down into a smaller volume, then the pressure of the gas is going to increase, and notice that's what's happening here. We're going up in pressure as we move from state A up to state B, but we're following an isotherm at the same temperature. So if we take PV over T final equals PV over T initial, and we let the two temperatures be the same, we can cancel them out, all right? This is our isothermal process. So we end up with P final V final equals P initial V initial. So here, let's do an example now um, of an isothermal process. So gas inside a cylinder is immersed in an ice water bath. The gas pressure is initially one atmosphere. The piston is pushed to compress the gas. The volume decreases from six liters to two liters. So we're told our initial uh, volume is six liters, and then finally when it gets squeezed down, it's at two liters. What is the final gas pressure? So remember what we just showed in the last slide. For an isothermal process, we have P final V final equals P initial V initial. Let's solve for P final, which is P initial V initial over V final. And now we can plug in our numbers. The initial pressure, we're going to, again, we're going to just keep this as atmospheres, okay? We're allowed to do this as long as we remember that's the um, unit that we're dealing with. Likewise, the volumes, um, we're dealing with liters here, and that's okay as long as both of them are in the same units of liters. Um, the, any conversion that we do would be canceled anyway. So the key thing is the volume, you know, um, it, it got reduced by a third, right? It went from six liters down to two liters. So even if we converted this to cubic meters, we would see the same reduction in volume by a factor of three. So let's just keep, make this as simple as possible and keep the volume in liters. So we can actually do this in our head. We have one times six divided by two, which is three. So our final pressure is three atmospheres. And in part B, we're asked to sketch a PV diagram of the process. So where do we start? Here's our I, our initial state is at a volume of six liters that was given, and the pressure is one atmosphere, okay? That was given as well. We know we move up an isotherm. So this is just a sketch, so we know it's gonna be some curved path like this. Remember, the isotherms are those hyperbolas, those curved paths, and we are gonna, we're gonna end up at our final state, F, which is at two liters here, and a uh, pressure of three atmospheres here. So this is what this process, you know, physically, this is what the process looks like, right? This piston, um, cylinder of gas with a piston, and we're compressing it in a, in a bath of ice water. But we're, we can plot this on a PV diagram as follows. So um, this is our, we're, we're basically done with this section. Um, this was a, a rather lengthy part. We covered a lot in this, uh, part of the lecture, we, we developed the ideal gas law, which is one of the most fundamental important laws in all of physics. And we also learned how to use a PV diagram. So we accomplished quite a bit. Um, I'll just leave you with this um, idea of a multi-step process. What we were dealing with so far were, was basically simple processes that were um, you know, either isothermal, isobaric, or isochoric. Sometimes um, a more complicated process um, is involved. For example, let's say we start with a gas here at state A, and we're going to end up over here at state B. Well, how do we get there? Well, there are many different, in fact, there are an infinite number of ways we can travel from A to B, right? We could travel all these different paths. One example of one that might you know, be relatively easy to analyze would be to first um, perform an isobaric process by moving straight over horizontally. All right, we're, notice we're jumping to another isotherm here, so the temperature is increasing. Notice also that the volume is increasing. So this would be um, an isobaric expansion. Um, then we might go down along this isotherm with an isothermal process. 
to this point here, and then we might drop straight down. Remember, a vertical line is an isochoric process to finally get to B. So this is, uh, this is what's called a multi-step process. All right, so that um, is a good place to end this um, part of the lecture. I will see you shortly for part three. Goodbye.